So, hi Matt, how are you? Oh, I'm great, Brett. How are you, mate? I'm very, very well. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. Have a little bit of a chat. Really love to have a bit of a chat to you today about the maker movement, exactly what it means, exactly uh, how it looks and how, how people can get on board and, and get involved and, and exactly what it means with, with um, the children. But before I get into that, I've got to ask you one question. I've seen you on Twitter and I know that you've got uh, Sir Matt Richards there as your title. Do I have to call? Do I have to like bow, or, or are you are you hang out with Sir Ken Robertson? <laughs> uh, that'd be nice if you want to bow to me every time we meet, Brett. But uh, yeah, I won't hold you to that. You'll uh, hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, actually I've been a long term, a long time fan of Sir Ken Robertson, and um, years ago um, I realised that online we can be anyone. We can recreate ourselves. So I decided to knight myself. And call myself <laughs> Sir Matt Richards, <laughs> and actually, it's got me. It's got me places. Um, we were catching the ferry actually from England to France once, uh, myself and the fam, and we got preferential treatment and uh, a special room purely <laughs> because of my Sir Matt Richards title. I didn't correct. <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. That is ab that, That's classic. That is. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I suppose too. Um, you, you mentioned there that you're travelling in England, but obviously you, you've got that Aussie accent. And I yeah. wonder if you can tell tell me about and, and tell everyone who'll be watching uh, a little bit about yourself, where you teach, your school, so we get a little bit of context. We know who 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 the real Sir Matt Richards is. Okay, cool. Um, I'm Matt Richards. Um, you can see my Twitter handle there, Sir Matt Richards, if you want to follow me. Um, Actually, if you want to know more info about anything we're talking about today, you can go to mattrichards.info. That's my blog. Uh, I'm the Director of E-Learning and Educational Technology at St. Columba Anglican School in Port Macquarie. We're an independent Anglican school on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. A beautiful place, beautiful place to live. Um, we are a pre-K to 12 school, so we've got uh, a bit over a thousand students here and about 130 teachers, I think. Um, and we, we've been doing some cool stuff. Because we're an independent school and because of my role, I, I manage both the IT, e-learning and library teams in the school. So because I, I'm kind of a, a hybrid role, we've got a lot of agility and we can do some innovative changes quickly. So um, we were the first school in Australia to um, migrate to the cloud with Google Apps for Education. Uh, the first school in Australia to um, deploy Chromebooks. Um, and we've really uh, pushed the envelope with emerging technologies. So we're, we're doing a lot of stuff with Oculus Rift, virtual reality in education. And uh, the subject of the talk this Sunday night uh, on Aussie Ed, your amazing uh, talk that you facilitate, is makerspaces. And so we've been in the news recently, um, uh, Prime 7 News. If you want to see those videos, you can go to my blog, uh, mattrichards.info. And you'll see, actually, I'll give you a sneak peek right now. Here's the makerspace. There you go. There's the makerspace through the window there. Um, nice and quiet because all the kids are in class at the moment, which is good for our talk. <laughs> uh, and um, so that's that's basically who I am um, and what I do. So would I be right in saying that you, you've you've very impressively you've listed a lot of first. Your school been a lot of first to do this, first to do that. To do that but would I be right in saying that one of your real passions is this this maker movement, is or the your maker space? Would that be true to say? Definitely, I think um, the maker movement really encapsulates um, what I love about the evolution of uh, learning right now. The um, uh, it's it's moving learning back to being student centric, and it's becoming experiential again. So we're we're learning by doing, uh, we're learning by following our passions. And we're learning by engaging with real-world global projects. Real-world global projects. That's that's good. Now, what what was it that led you to get to being so involved in makerspaces? Like, how did you how did you get there? Was there an evolution, or did like did you were you inspired by something? Or uh, yes, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, the, the space we have up here uh, was where my office was, and uh, the IT was 
And I found myself running little projects and things up here. It's actually upstairs in the library or what used to be the library here at our school. Um, and so the building that I manage, which we now call the hub or the Dawson hub, uh, it's a it's the central learning heart of the school. So it's uh, the library, um, the maker space, the uh, ed tech team, which is our name for the IT team, uh, and e-learning. Um, so it's like the central nexus where all the kids can come and um, be part of this learning community. A, a, a big uh, concept that I've supported for a long time is learning commons or learning communities. Mm -hmm. With this, you, you, you talk of learning commons, you talk of these learning communities, and, and I've, I've, I've heard a lot on, online, particularly coming out of the States, uh, talking about the maker movement, but you only have to go to uh, some ed tech conferences, and you, you're seeing a lot of global movement. There's a, there's a, there's a real international momentum towards the maker movement. Why, why, why do you think it has such a powerful international in the international movement towards the maker movement okay I think um, that's another awesome question I think um, uh, what's occurring and not just in learning and education but as a culture is that we're becoming creators again we're becoming makers uh, I think for a really long time uh, the vast majority of the population have been consumers. So we are told to uh, go out and buy things, and it's been a disposable culture. Like if we, we only have to talk to the previous generation, our mums and dads, and they would fix things, and they would know how things work, and we've kind of lost that. We've, we, we seem to have been, become a culture where we use technology, really amazing technology daily, and we have no idea how it works. And I think that's um, something that we need to address. And I think naturally, human beings want to be creators. We want to be makers. We, we want to know how things work. And so once we provide a space for that to occur, it just happens. I love it. Do you know what you just gave me? I've got a little bit of goosebump happening on my arm here. You just gave me <laughs> a, a, a flashback to my childhood, and, and and I think a lot of people, grandparents and things like that, would have had something similar. I, I can remember my grandfather had his shed out the back, and he was tinkering in that shed. And was, if something broke, he he knew how to fix it. And 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 mum would take the chair to you know chuck it in the back of the car, drive over the pop. And Pop would get in his shed, and he had the vices, and he had all the tools, and he'd he'd tinker away and fix it. And and it's interesting that uh, I suppose you're right. We we we've we've evolved to these this consumeristic uh, approach rather than this creative. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think just uh, one more point on that. Um, I I really like the um, there's a, a a term that has come out recently called prosumer. So we're, we're becoming um, producers as well as consumers. And I think that this is being reflected now in learning and how we do things. And a big part of that has been amazing technology such as 3D printing. So what we're finding is um, no longer are we reliant on mass production to get those economies of scale needed to, to get things made. So an example is, if um, if Dad has some you know old um, '70s Mustang car and uh, a piece of the engine breaks, um, historically you'd have to send off to the states and get that really expensive part sent over. Well, we're in a world now where you buy the design for that part for a couple of dollars or find it for free and then print the part yourself. Um, China print houses now, so where the students that we have now are entering a world where they can create things immediately. And so really we need to be thinking about the innovative applications of that creative process and how we can start not only creating but fixing some of the, the real big issues we've got in the world today. I, I love what you've just said there. That there's some real true real world application to this whole concept. I, I suppose that leads me to say how does your actual maker space in an educational setting, how does your, your maker space actually work in, in your school? Yep. What does it look like? What are the kids doing? All right. So um, uh, the way I, I, I set it up was 
we took down the walls. We I'll show you again so you got a little sneak yep. peek. There we go. So it's a big kind of open plan space um, uh, with some funky kind of furniture in there that we just moved from downstairs. After I got back from um, my trip to Google for the Google Teacher Academy, I was inspired to get some colourful furniture, so I put that in. And, and then we put some desks in, and rather than make this something that I had to impose on the rest of the school and do during class time, or to rather than creating another duty for the other teachers, I just really sort of um, facilitated this whole thing myself. So what I do is every lunch and recess, um, I open the space up, and I let the kids, anyone K to 12, come up into the space. And I just manage it. So um, I've got a big glass wall here between my office and the space. And most of the time I'm out there, however. And um, and I help facilitate. Um, and the way that we made that work was a lot of the time I might be in a meeting or at a conference or something like that. So we've actually got one of those, you know at the cinema, those red ropes you see that sort of <laughs> the flowing? <Yep. laughs> well, we actually got one of them. And we, we've got it at the bottom of the stairs down there. And so the kids know if the red ropes across Mr. Richards isn't there and the space isn't open. And if I am here, we have it open, which is kind of good for building resilience. And um, and I, I like that sort of casual arrangement as, as well. I think it really works. Um, so that's basically how it works. And, and also before and after school, the kids come up here and use the space. So it's a really informal, non-structured learning lab. If you could give any tips, obviously you've been doing this for a little while now, if there was another teacher out there who was thinking about setting up a maker space, uh, with your experience, what, what sort of advice would you, would you give to them? I'd say just do it. Um, it's, it's really great. In the last couple of weeks, I've had loads of um, tweets uh, contacting me and um, saying, check this out, I've started, I've just got it happening. And I think that's the, the biggest uh, piece of advice I'd give is just do it, to start. And the way that you could start is uh, get a little cheap kit, like start with a makey-makey uh, kit. Uh, like I said before, if you want more info on anything I've mentioned here, check my blog, Matt Rich has got info. That. The makey makey, there's another little term there for anyone watching at home. Uh, might yeah. think of Google makey makey, they're really cool. Yeah, yeah, makey makey is, is really good and it's cheap. It's a great way to start. And the other thing is, you don't need to be a really rich school to do this. I've had I've quite a few people say, oh, it's all good for you and, you know, you've got that 3D printer and, well, you can get cheap 3D printers even. But um, start with something small. Start with a makey makey. Uh, and even at the back of your classroom, you don't need a dedicated space. Like, I'm really lucky that I've got this amazing space here, but I've actually got colleagues uh, in various schools that just have a little desk at the back of their room and they've got a kit set up there and they, like, you know, they have makerspace uh, hour um, for an hour a day where the kids can have, you know, this project-based unstructured learning time. It's, it, it just sounds like something you, you, you get into, you get your hands a little bit dirty, maybe roll up the sleeve. And, and, and the kids get in there and, uh, and, and, and get busy too. Uh, uh, just while you're at that, Brett, one other thing. If you've got zero cash at all, uh, a really a great other way to start is to get some of your old dodgy computers that were destined for the scrap heap and let the kids take them apart. So we've actually got old laptops and computers that the school is going to turf uh, on the desk over there. And the kids, even that is an amazing learning process. And um, we've actually got some old um, computers that the kids have like rebuilt into Frankenstein machines. So that's another idea if you if you're short on funds. That's good. That's good, and that's practical because there's always uh, a, almost a, a trouble with storage of old equipment because a lot of schools have put so much money into these resources, and then uh, it's almost heartbreaking to to see they they might not be up to scratch for current needs, but. Oh, it's just heartbreaking to, to see them, you know, in, pile up in the in, in the rubbish. Show. Yeah. I'm gonna finish with just one question now, and it, and it could be the most challenging one that I've asked you, and but I'm hoping the answer will be the most beautiful as well. So <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure. The answer <laughs> If you were to reflect upon this year, um, in, in particular focus with the whole maker space and maker movement, 
Yeah. What would be your highlight? What's the one thing you go, you know what, that was that made it worthwhile. I, I love that that happened. Okay. Um, I think, oh, that's a tough one because we've had some <laughs> amazing things happen. Um, I'll give you two examples. Sorry, I can't take it down to one. No, no, no. I'll, take okay. two. I'll take two. Okay, all right. So one uh, example that I love is, and it's got to do with this learning commons, learning community thing, is um, I was walking through the makerspace one day and there was a student, a little girl from year two, tiny little um, student, and she was teaching a, a student from year 11 how to use a 3D printer. And I just thought that's amazing. Like that kind of really blew me away. And here we've got we've got this real learning community where students learn from each other. That was one. And um, and the other one example I'll give you, which I think is kind of uh, cool, is um, two students from Year Nine. They're actually in my Year Nine technology class. I teach Year Nine IST as well. And um, uh, they've developed from scratch. Um, uh, a first-person shooter game for the Oculus Rift. So they've actually, in Unity 3D gaming engine, they've completely created a really like an industry standard game. And they did this completely student self-directed. I am not an expert in Unity 3D at all. Yeah. Uh, but just, just the fact that we had this amazing high-end tech like the Oculus Rift, the VR headset, uh, um, it, that was inspiration enough. So I think the passion and the motivation, the engagement levels, create these amazing learning outcomes. You know, like really stuff that you, you see. You know, twenty-year-olds achieving. Well, we've got fourteen-year-olds achieving it, and that that to me was awesome. I'm just thinking, if they can do that today, what what are they going to be able to do tomorrow? Well, here's. Oh, sorry, I'm going to give you three. There's one. I've got to tell you one more. Um, <laughs> there is, there is, um, I run this um, inter-school Minecraft uh, project at the moment between us and a friend's school, Kieran Nolan. There's a shout out to Kieran Nolan um, at Warana Park Primary down in. Um, Melbourne, and every Friday uh, we've got a group of kids here and a group of kids there. I call them the tech ninjas here. They're my little tech Jedis in the school. Um, and they meet in World in Minecraft, and they're creating their ultimate school of the future in Minecraft together. Okay, So we're kind of like modelling this the new the new world of connected um, communication. Um, and But one of the students who's um, in Year 3, uh, he was having problems with a couple of the kids being naughty. They call it griefing in Minecraft when you're being naughty, right? So if you swear or you destroy someone's stuff, it's called griefing, okay? And he was getting sick of a couple of the kids being a bit naughty. So he actually learnt how to code um, plugins for Minecraft um, from scratch in JavaScript, right? And he, he wrote this plugin in JavaScript that if a child swore in World, it booted them off the server and came up with a message that said, swearing isn't nice, please don't oh. do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was just mind-blowing. So you're talking about him doing that now. Like, where are these students going to be? Like, when they're 17, 18, um, they're the kind of innovators we need. We've got real-world problems that, that need innovative solutions. And so we, we want to give the green fields for these innovators. We want to give them the space, uh, the, the unstructured space and the tools to become real innovators. Look, I just think what you're doing is, is awesome. Those, those stories there, just, that's just magic. And, and, and I think what you've, what you've just done there is you've shown the link between practical people literally tearing things apart. But it's not about practically what they're making with their hands. It's about a mind shift up here. It's about having children then think that they can create their own solutions. They're in command of, of what they're able to achieve. And and that story that you just finished is, is the prime example of that. That's, that's a child who is creatively making their own decisions and, and, and finding solutions to their own real world problems. And, yeah. and as educators, that's exactly what we're after, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Mate, thank you so much for, for stopping by and, and, and having a chat with me. I'm really looking forward 
to our Aussie Ed Chat on Sunday as we as we delve deeper into the Maker Movement. If you're interested, obviously, in finding out more about the Maker Movement, if you happen to be watching this video, make sure you go to mattrichards.info. Did I get that right, Matt? Yeah, and there's my Twitter handle right there. Um, so Matt Richards for Twitter and yeah, Matt Richards for info. And mate, it's been great having a bit of a chat with you. Looking forward to having um, more action on on, on Sunday. And yeah. uh, to anyone who happens to be watching, I hope you get involved with the Maker Movement too. And thank you very much, Matt. Oh, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to it, mate. All right. Well, I'll, I'll see you later. See you, mate. Bye. Bye.